أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل اللهم اخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا من خزائن علومك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما My brothers and my sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam was put under an ultimatum. He had to pledge allegiance to Yazid or he had no other choice but to rise against him. And of course the Imam would never pledge allegiance to Yazid. He decided to leave Medina and go towards Mecca but not because he wanted to stay in Mecca. In truth, he wanted Iraq, but he had to wait for the people of Iraq to be ready for him. And so he waited. Iraq was the only place with the land that was fertile enough that could accept the blood of Imam al-Hussein to revive Islam. All the other lands in the Ummah were not ready for this, only the land of Iraq. So the Imam needed Iraq, even though he knew that many in Iraq would betray him eventually. He knew that they were scattered and divided. He knew what they had done to his father and his brother. He needed to make sure that his revolution takes place in Iraq. But the first stop was Mecca. In Mecca, he was able to be amongst the Sahaba and their children, amongst the children of the Ansar and the Muhajirun, He was noticing and observing their political opinions, trying to see which ways he could move the political movement, which ways he could bring the people towards him. And so he stayed there, waiting for the people of Iraq to be ready as they sent him letter after letter. Slowly, the political opinions were more and more in favor of Imam al-Hussein in Iraq. They were sending letters by twos and by fours. The people of Kufa were gathering in their houses, twos and fours, in tens and twenties, and they would send letter after letter. For four months, the Imam remained in Mecca. He received 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, up to 12,000 letters. And the signatures were way more. The signatures were up to 20 to 30,000. Meanwhile, the Imam was sending his messengers to other parts of the Ummah, to Basra and other parts, so that he could gather as many supporters as he could for this movement against Yazid ibn Muawiyah. The Imam was going to take what was rightfully his and for the Ahlul Bayt to take the leadership of Islam back so that he could reform it back to the way it was under his grandfather sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now the Imam knew that in Iraq, there were going to be people that were afraid. There were going to be people that were not completely on the path. The Imam knew this, but the Imam also knows that these people need a leader. When the leader is there, he can turn your fear into courage. He can take your division and turn it into unity. The Imam knew that if he was able to gather all the people under one leadership, then they could reform and bring back the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala back to what was originally intended in time of the Prophet. So, The Imam wanted to send one of his most trusted messengers to Kufa. Once he had felt that the Iraqis were ready, it was time for him to finally act. And he went to his beloved cousin, Muslim ibn Aqil, the son of Aqil, Aqil being the brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. He told Muslim, Muslim, you go to Kufa, you observe the political environment, you see if these people sending us these 12,000 letters are upon what they promise. That they are saying, come O Imam, we are with you Ya Imam, we are ready to rise up Ya Imam, come and we will follow you Ya Imam. Go and check if they are upon truth, if you verify for me that they are indeed waiting for me, then I will come. That was Muslim's mission. And it is very important for us to dissect 
Muslim Ibn Aqil's actions because this is the pivotal moment in the journey towards Karbala. Many people in their analysis of what occurred before Karbala end up blaming Muslim Ibn Aqil. They blame him because they say either he should have been able to take over Kufa or beat Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, the governor of Kufa at the time, to make sure that everyone was ready for Imam al Hussein. That if Muslim acted differently, that Karbala would not have happened. This is all down to an incorrect political analysis, an incorrect, an incorrect historic analysis of what occurred at the time. We need to look exactly at what happened in the story of Muslim ibn Aqil. And that's what we'll be speaking about in today's session, inshallah. Muslim's mission was to go to Kufa and verify the truth behind the letters. That was all. This is the first point that we have to establish. It was not to go there and begin the revolution. No. I am Imam al Hussein. When I come, I will begin the movement. I am the leader. I am the son of the Prophet. I am the catalyst of the Prophet. The movement begins with the son of Rasulullah. The movement does not begin with Muslim ibn Aqil. People think that Muslim should have gone there and round up the soldiers and risen against Yazid and Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Those were not the orders given to Muslim ibn Aqil. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, the one who went to Kufa and represented Yazid in Kufa, he was not even in Kufa at the time. And I will speak about the story chronologically so that you don't get lost with me. Muslim ibn Aqil goes to Kufa by the orders of Imam Hussein alayhi He accepts the mission. Ya Imam, I will go to Kufa. I will verify the claims and I will report back to you on what I find. Once Muslim arrives to Kufa, he stays in the house of Mukhtar al thaqafi and this was a very strategic move because Mukhtar was the son-in-law of the governor of Kufa at the time, Nu'man ibn Bashir. So Nu'man, the governor of Kufa, is the father-in-law of Mukhtar. And Muslim went and stayed with Mukhtar. So Muslim was safe because Nu'man was not going to raid the house of his son-in-law. He saw Muslim, but he said, you know, as long as Muslim doesn't come out and provoke us, as long as he doesn't try to fight us, we won't fight him. Because Nu'man was representing the Umayyads. So Muslim stayed in the house of Mukhtar and he had to move very secretly so as not to provoke Nu'man and his government. So now Muslim is in the house of Mukhtar. And Mukhtar's house had a hall. And this hall could fit 150 people in it. So Muslim began to call for all of those who had signed the letters, the 20 to 30,000 people who had signed the letters, that were 12,000 letters. People began to come to Mukhtar's house. They came in groups of 150 and 150. So 150 people would come and they would enter into the house of Mukhtar and they would sit in the hall and they narrate and they say Muslim ibn Aqil would stand and he would tell us about the mission of Hussein ibn Ali. And he would tell us of what was to occur and then we would give the bay'ah to Muslim so that it represents the bay'ah to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Muslim was receiving the bay'ah for Abu Abdullah. So people would come one by one, they would give the bay'ah one by one, one by one, 150 at a time. This 150 would be giving the bay'ah now. In two hours, there would be another 150 coming. In six hours, there were another 150 coming. In the night time, there would be 150 coming. Tomorrow morning, another 150. And Mukhtar would count them. Today, we had 5, 6, 700. Tomorrow, we had 700. Of tomorrow, we had 800. Mukhtar was counting how many people were giving bay'ah. One by one, they were giving bay'ah to Muslim ibn Aqil. Now, some of them were ready for whatever was to occur. One of them, as they gave bay'ah, they said, Muslim, this is my bay'ah to my master, Hussein ibn Ali. I am ready to give my soul for his cause. May my soul be his ransom. Whatever it takes, my blood, my family, everything. Another one would come and he would say, I don't want to die. 
I am with Hussein ibn Ali. I want him to succeed. And I know that he's upon truth. But I have a family. I, I don't want to die. They were both Shia. They were both followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But one of them is Istishadi. And the other one is not Istishadi. He's not ready for martyrdom. It's not a condition for a Shi'i to be Istishadi. Not every Shi'i is ready for martyrdom. That's not a condition in your Tashayyur. But it's an incomplete Tashayyur. To have a complete, perfect Tashayyur, you need to become that Istishadi. So Imam Al-Hussein was coming for that person that was not yet upon the complete Tashayyur. It's for him the Imam was coming. He was coming to complete the deen of these people, the ones that were not ready to die for the cause. Because if you don't have something to die for, there's nothing that you can live for. Nothing. They are intertwined. Living and dying for the cause is intertwined. Imam al-Hussein was not going to stop himself from coming because there were some people that were not ready to give their lives. When the Imam was present amongst them, he would make them ready to give their lives. So Muslim was taking the bay'ah of the people. He kept taking the pledges of allegiance until it reached an amount that was 18,000 people. After about a month or so, just less than a month, Muslim Ibn Aqil has the bay'ah of 18,000. And so he sees, yes, these people are upon truth. They are, as they said in their letters, so he verified the accounts. And he sent word to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. As you ordered me, ya Imam, I came and I observed and I saw and I spoke to the people. And he did it very, very strategically in groups of 150. Now here is a point that we have to consider. Once Muslim takes the bay'ah, of the 150, where does he put them? Does he have a camp, a soldier's camp, a base, a HQ? No. Does he have food and provisions to take this 150 and take them out into the desert? No. What does he tell them? Very naturally and logically, once he receives the bayah, he says, thank you very much. Return to your homes. We will be in contact shortly. When the Imam sends word, we will call upon you. Now you've given the bay'ah. Thank you, go home, we'll be in contact. Thank you, go home, we'll be in contact. People think that Muslim Ibn Aqil had 18,000 people with him, that he could just gather them like that. No. He could only see them 150 at a time. He took the pledges of allegiance and then they went to their homes. So when they think that he had 18,000 warriors, how come he couldn't take over Kufa? It wasn't 18,000 like that. That needs time. To organize 18,000, you need time. And you don't do it secretly. He was trying his best not to provoke the governor, who was Na'man. So, Muslim ibn Aqil was doing his duty, taking the bay'ah, verifying the accounts of the letters. The people would go home and await the orders from Imam al Hussein. Alayhi Everything was going very well. The political climate couldn't be better. 18,000 people had given the bay'ah. Most Muslim had sent word to Abu Abdullah salam, to come towards Kufa. The people were ready for you. And at this time, Nu'man, even though he could see what was going on without the details, he wasn't provoked yet, so he wasn't doing anything about it. But the Umayyads, the representatives around him, they saw what was happening. And they did not care that Mukhtar was the son-in-law of Nu'man. They reported to the government in Sham. And so Yazid ibn Muawiyah sent forth Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad into Kufa. And now this changed everything. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad comes into Kufa with the men from Sham. He comes in and he changes everything. Now, first of all, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he's not really ibn Ziyad. The governor before him was Ziyad ibn Abi, they call him. So you have Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and Ziyad ibn Abi. First of all, Ziyad ibn Abi, they call him Ziyad ibn Abi because the son of his dad, because his dad was not known. His father was not known. His mother had one of those occupations. So Muawiyah said, my father Abu Sufyan is your father. 
even though he wasn't. So they said, okay, Ziyad ibn Abi Sufyan. Walakin, his real title was Ziyad ibn Abi, the son of his father. His father was unknown. And when it came to his son, Ubaidullah, they said Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, but even then, it was not known that Ziyad was actually his father. That was also a claim. So he was known amongst the people as Ibn Marjana. That was his mother's name. She also was amongst those with that occupation. So you had Ibn Marjana, who was Ubaidullah, and then you had Ziyad ibn Abi. Both of them had claims that their father was someone who it wasn't proven that it was truly their father. And that's why Imam al Hussein when he calls when he calls back to Ubaidullah, he says, Ayyuhad Da'i ibn Da'i. Okay, Da'i, the one who makes a claim. Because he's saying these are both claims. It's a mudda. You made a claim and you are one who makes a claim about your father, the son of one who made a claim about his father. So when the Imam said those famous lines, he was pointing towards their lineage. How can one of your lineage come and try to humiliate someone of my lineage? Someone who is the grandson of Rasulullah and the son of Fatima al-Zahra salam, the son of Ali Abi Talib salam, and you, the one who claims someone is their father, who isn't their father, and the one that you claim is your father, also is not known who his father is. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad ibn Marjana, he comes in to the shock of Muslim. And he immediately begins his mission to stop the movement of Muslim ibn Aqil. At this time, Muslim has to change his strategy. He took Muslim by surprise. So Muslim had to leave the house of Mukhtar. Slowly now, the Shia were being hunted all over again to block the movement of Muslim ibn Aqil. Muslim then goes to one of the most prominent Shi'is and chiefs of the clans in Kufa. And he goes to the house of Hani ibn Arwa, the chief of the Midhaj clan. Muslim found no reason yet to go back to Imam al Hussein. He was so close to having everything ready for when the Imam arrives, and he had already sent word for him to come. So he decided to lay low in Hani's house, especially because Hani was a huge figure in Kufa, and his clan was one of the biggest clans. So he was relatively safe in Hani's house. Now, Ubaidullah couldn't find Muslim. He was trying to hunt him down. He started to use the same tactics as his father, the spy system. And he began to go and speak to all those people that used to spy for his father. And he initiated 4,000 men that would infiltrate into the town and try to find where Muslim Ibn Aqil was hiding. The elite Shia knew where Muslim was. And if you really wanted to go to Muslim, you'd come to them. Meanwhile, in Hani's house was a 95-year-old sick man on his deathbed. He was there with Muslim Ibn Aqil. And this man, his name was Shuraik Ibn Awar. He knew Ubaidullah Ibn Ziyad. And he knew Ubaidullah was going to come and visit him in his sickness. Now, Ubaidullah was coming to the house of Hani ibn Arwa to visit Shuraik. There is a narration, the famous narration that says that they asked Muslim ibn Aqil to go into the closet and hide. And that when Muslim was in the closet, Ubaidullah would come into the house and that's when Muslim could kill him. Ubaidullah indeed came into the house of Hani and he sat down. And Muslim was in the closet and he never came out of the closet. Ubaidullah then left the house and nothing happened. Afterwards, according to this narration, they asked Muslim, why didn't you kill Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad? And apparently Muslim says, I do not kill my enemy from behind. That's not the way that I fight. Now, this does, of course, seem honorable at first sight. But Ibn Kathir actually says in his report that Muslim comes out of the closet and he says, 
a mu'min does not kill another mu'min from behind. So now, not only is it not, I do not kill from behind, it's, I cannot kill a believer from behind. So we, we are now insinuating that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad is a mu'min. And this hadith in itself is questionable because guerrilla warfare and tactics in these times of war does not mean that one goes against their principle. If we're fighting a power like Yazid, then if Muslim had seen him and seen the opportunity, the logical and natural approach would be for Muslim to decimate him. Because Imam al Hussein was coming. This would not be going against the principle. This is evil. Of, against the enemies of Allah, against the evildoers. This would be a good thing. Guerrilla warfare here would be a good thing. But in truth, what occurred was not this. What occurred was that Muslim was waiting for Abidullah ibn Ziyad. And if Muslim had it his way, he would have killed him. Whether face to face, whether from behind, he would have killed him right there and then. But what happened was, Hani ibn Urwa asked Muslim and Hani's wife, Asked Muslim, please do not kill our guest, even if he's our enemy and your enemy, in our home. You see, anyone who knows anything about Arabian culture, especially pre Islamic times, and as it moved into the Islamic times, and the tradition that's continued until today, whether Muslim or not, amongst the Arabs, is the issue of the daif, the guest. One who is a guest is sacred with the Arabs. You cannot upset the guest. Sometimes a guest would remain in your house for three days and you don't ask him why he's even there. The guest would remain at someone's home even if they were the enemy and they would be safe. And if anything was to happen to that guest, that person would be humiliated and an embarrassment amongst the Arabs. The honor of the person and the reputation of the person would be equivalent to dirt. And Hani was a noble man, so he couldn't have blood spill in his house with someone coming to visit him that wasn't coming to fight. If he was coming to fight, that's a different issue. But he's coming in with the idea that he has safe haven in your house, even as an enemy. So he enters the house. Muslim ibn Aqil respects the wishes of his host, respects the wishes of Hani's wife. Please do not kill your enemy and spill blood in our home. Please, because of the akhlaq of Muslim and the deen of Muslim, he accepts the wishes of his host and he puts himself in a place where Ubaidullah does not see him. And Ubaidullah comes to the house and leaves and nothing happens between him and Muslim. He has no idea that Muslim is there. Ubaidullah then returns to the palace. And the people don't know where Muslim is until a young boy is able to infiltrate the circles of the elite Shia. And he befriends one of the warriors to be martyred in Karbala, Muslim ibn Awsajah. Now this Muslim ibn Awsajah, when he spent time with this young boy, and this young boy had said he had money for the Ahlul Bayt and he gave it forward to him and he spent several days at his house. Once he had achieved Ibn Awsajah's trust, he asked to see Muslim ibn Aqil. And so when Ibn Awsaja went and spoke to Muslim ibn Aqil and got permission from him to bring this boy into Hani's house, he brought the boy. The boy came, he met Muslim ibn Aqil, he finally knew where Muslim was. Once he left Hani's house, he went straight to the palace. And he told Ubaidullah that he had found Muslim. And Ubaidullah now knew that Muslim was in Hani ibn Urwa's house. Now that Ubaidullah knew where Muslim ibn Aqil was, he decided to take his next steps very carefully. He didn't go and just arrest Muslim ibn Aqil. Instead, he decided to cut the head of the snake. He slowly brought the chiefs of the tribes that he could speak to and bribe. And then he had them slowly soften Hani ibn Urwa up 
as he summoned him to come to the palace. He made Hani feel safe. He had just visited his home not too long ago. And now he summoned him to the palace. It seemed harmless. Hani thought, well, he was just here. And he's calling me. He couldn't have found out about Muslim. Barely anyone has been coming. Let me go to the palace. Hani did not inform anyone from the Midhaj tribe, his clan. He went to the palace. Once he got to the palace, he was cornered. And Ubaidullah told him, So, you've been holding Muslim this whole time? You traitor? They grabbed Hani, they beat Hani, and they imprisoned Hani. And his clan didn't know where he was. Meanwhile, the person next in line, in power, in the clan of Hani, his name was Amr. And Amr was the brother-in-law of Hani. And there was competition between them. So Ubaidullah spoke to Amr. Before the Midhaj tribe found out about Hani. And he told him, You speak on behalf of your people when they come. Hani was calling for his people in the dungeons of the palace. Oh my clan, my tribe, where are you? Where is everyone? Why hasn't anyone come yet? When the people began to notice that Hani was not home, that he had not come home from the palace, the tribe of Midhaj gathered and they went to protest outside the palace and they were a huge clan. They would have caused a huge problem for Abidullah ibn Ziyad. They went to call for Hani. Abidullah already had his inside man, Amr. He had come on the head of the clan. Now what he needed was a representative on his side to speak on behalf of the palace. And he wasn't going to take someone from Sham to do that. He wanted someone from Kufa. You see how these people work? They're diabolical in their thinking. He went to the judge of the town, Shuraih. Shuraih al-Qadi. Shuraih was trusted by all. He was known as a just and fair man. He told Shuraih, Listen here, O judge. The tribe of Hani ibn Arwa is on the way and they're going to call for Hani. And you must go out there and you must tell them, Hani bi khair. Hani is safe. You go out there and you speak to them. Once you tell them that, you're free to go and you're under my protection. But if you don't, then I will strike your neck. Now Shuraih was in a predicament. He didn't have much time to consider what course of action he was going to take. He was a just man. But now he was in a position where he would be responsible for literally everything that was to transpire afterwards. You know when we see the hadiths of the Ahlul Bayt, and they tell us one hour of contemplation is greater than 70 years of worship. This is the hour of contemplation, my brothers and my sisters. In this hour, Shuraih was going to choose between heaven and hell. His whole akhirah relied upon this hour. This hour was going to define 70 years of his life, let alone if they were all years of worship. Shuraih made his decision. The tribe of Hani was outside the palace. They were calling for Hani to come out. Where is our leader? Where is our chief? Amr was on the head of the clan, calling for Hani. Shuraih al-Qadi comes out. And he says, calm down, calm down. My good people of Kufa, Hani Bekhair. And when Amr said, Hani Bekhair, Shuraih, Shuraih, you're saying that? We take your word. Now, when the clan saw Shuraih said, Hani Bekhair, and they saw their leader, the next in line, saying, I accept what Shuraih says, and they all trust Shuraih, they decide, ah, oh, 
there's nothing to worry about. Hani must be in deep discussion with Ubaidullah. Let's not get involved in the discussions of the big players. Let's go home. So then they left. Hani remained in the dungeon calling, calling for his people. Muslim was hiding at home. He couldn't come out. When he saw the clan return without Hani, he knew things were not as they appeared. He knew Hani was in danger. He knew and he didn't have much time to make a decision on what he was going to do next. Muslim had sent one of his messengers with the clan. And when the messengers reported back, they told him what he had already known, that Hani was not safe. So Muslim had to decide at that moment what he was going to do next. You see, Hani ibn Urwa was a key. He was a loyal Shi'i. Muslim couldn't afford to lose him. If he loses Hani, Hani was a key for the coming of Imam al-Hussein. He couldn't lose that clan, that tribe. But if he could save Hani right now, if he could retrieve Hani, and Hani would make his clan rise up, and then they could have a huge number to go and fight against Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, and settle the environment for the coming of Imam al-Hussein. So, it's go and save Hani right now, or lose Hani. And we lose almost the whole plan. Not only that, but Ubaidullah was going to take out the chiefs that were loyal to Muslim one by one. Or, Ubaidullah was going to send for Muslim. If Muslim was to extend or postpone his movement, even 5-10 minutes, his life would be in danger. He didn't even have 15, 15 minutes to sit down and think about what he was going to do. Muslim told his messenger, go to whoever you can find. Go and speak to everyone that you can find that follows us, that was in the house of Mukhtar, and tell them that we are going to go to the palace right now, that Hani ibn Urwa is not safe, and we need to go and save him. It's now or never. If we want to rise up with Hussein ibn Ali, we must move immediately. But there was no time to gather 18,000 people, the ones who gave bay'ah. That needs a few days. There weren't a few days. He had 10, 15 minutes max. Muslim went out into the street with whoever he could find. They started off as a few people in their tens. Then he gathered as many as he could and they went towards the palace of Abidullah ibn Ziyad. Now, we are told that there were 4,000 warriors with Muslim at this time. And we have to question this number. Who said there were 4,000? How? Who counted them? Who counted them in 10 minutes? Who counted them in 15 minutes? How did he gather 4,000 people that quickly? Not only that, but when it comes to the big wars, when it comes to the wars in Safin, you say Muawiyah, for example, brought 100,000 people. Imam Ali brought 80,000 people in the war of Jamal, in the war of etc, etc. Yes, we can verify those numbers because there was a registration. There were soldiers, they would sign up for the army, they would receive their wages, and their name was in a book. Those 4,000, who are they? Who counted them? What names? No one knows. Who counted them? No one knows. So it's very highly unlikely that there were 4,000 people. Especially because when they went to the palace, they couldn't even lay siege to a palace that was only about 50 meters you know, in width and length. They couldn't lay siege to that palace, meaning he was with but only a few men. But because they were so desperate, he had to go with these few men. And he called for his loyal supporters to come and follow after him. Everyone who knows, everyone who gave bay'ah, come and follow me. I'm going to Ubaidullah now, but time cannot wait. I cannot wait for Hani to be killed. I cannot wait for any other chiefs to be taken. I cannot wait for them to come and kill me. Not because he cares about his own life for himself, but because he is there as the representative of Imam al Hussein. Muslim ibn Aqil emerges into the street with Muslim ibn Awsijah on his right and Abu Tamama as Sa'idi on his left with their swords in hand and men around them. And they march towards the palace. They approach the palace with their flags. 
Meanwhile, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad had thought his plan was going perfectly. People were gathered outside his palace and he was giving them a speech. Then he started hearing noises, war cries. He called out, what is that noise? And the people screamed. Muslim ibn Aqil has come with those who gave bay'ah to Hussein ibn Ali. At this moment, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad's eyes become widened. He's taken by surprise. He can't believe that Muslim ibn Aqil has come with such few warriors. But still, the courageous Muslim strikes fear into Ubaidullah's heart. The coward runs back into his palace with his guards. They run back and he has to think quickly about what to do. He knows time is still on his side. Muslim is outside with the flag and he's calling for the coward. Come out and face me, Ya Ubaidullah. Come out and face me. Free Hani ibn Urwa. Come out and face us. Unfortunately, Muslim did not have the sufficient amount of warriors to take over the castle or lay siege to the castle. Now, Ubaidullah had sent for the chiefs of Kufa to come to his aid. So now people from outside the palace were coming. At the same time, Muslims, companions, and soldiers were also preparing themselves and coming to fight. When the chiefs of the clans get there, they start to throw rocks at Muslim his companions. And Ubaidullah's main tactic right now is to block the roads that lead towards the palace so that we corner all of the soldiers of Muslim ibn Aqil before they can all get together. So we keep them in groups of fives and ten and fifteen. Don't let them get into big groups. So the soldiers of Ubaidullah took those orders. And the amount of soldiers that Muslim ibn Aqil had, they couldn't go and stop every soldier that left the palace. Unfortunately, they did not have the manpower. So many people were able to leave the palace and go to shut off the roads before the cavalry of Muslim had arrived. So what they did was play, divide and conquer. Slowly, they were now dividing the army of Muslim. No one was able to come to Muslim's aid whilst the roads for those to come to the aid of Ubaidullah were open. They were coming slowly, more and more, until Ubaidullah had a sufficient amount of people that he could rely on. And then he decided to go for the counter-attack. Meanwhile, Muslim was still there with his flag and his loyal companions, but no one had come to help. They had either left him or they were stopped by the soldiers of Raidullah. Some of them were taken and arrested. Some of them were imprisoned. Ubaidullah now initiated his counterattack. As he watched on from the top of the palace, Muslim could only fight with those who were with him at the time, but a few men. His supporters were caught and imprisoned. His army was divided of those that even wanted to come and help. Now, outside the, pa the palace, there were street fights, skirmishes, with Muslim and his companions against the soldiers of Ubaidullah up until Maghrib time. Now they were bloodied and tired. Muslim went to pray his Salat. Now the people of Sham, the fighters that came with Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, they were threatening anyone who supported Muslim. And they began to threaten not only fighters, but their families. They began to threaten anyone close to them. They said, we are the soldiers of Amir al-Mu'mineen Yazid ibn Mu'awiyah. And if you know what's good for you, you will leave Muslim. Anyone from here on connected to Muslim, not only them, but their entire family's lives are at risk. Slowly, you began to see people in Kufa, the, your brother, your son, your father, your wife, your mother, everyone would come and say, run, run. They would come and tell each other, go home, leave, run, stay away. Bit by bit, the people with Muslim Ibn Aqil were becoming less and less. When Muslim Ibn Aqil was in the masjid, they were 30. At the last point, as he left the masjid, 
to go back out into the street, they became 10. Only 10 men remained with him. Now Muslim was only with these 10. These 10 never left him. These 10 remained with him. They were bloodied and battered and bruised and they had been battling all day. And Muslim was wounded from top to bottom. <sighs> now they had to run. They had to retreat. They had no other way. They realized they had been defeated. They could no longer stand in front of the forces of Abaydullah in front of the palace. And so they retreated into the dark, into the alleyways, as they were being hunted. These 10 never left him. Of course, Muslim ibn Awsajah was amongst them, the great hero of Karbala. Muslim then told these remaining 10, listen, our only hope is for us to go back to Imam al Hussein. There is no future for us here in Kufa. But we can't all remain in the same place. If they find us and kill all of us in the same place, we haven't achieved anything. So, you, my loyal companions, my ten, the ones that remained, now we must split up. Muslim ibn Awsajah and Abu Tamama, they're of the ones that were able to leave Kufa in the night. And they were able to join the caravan of Imam al Hussein because they were fighting with him in Karbala. But the others, they were caught and they were slaughtered. They had split up. Now Muslim was alone. Muslim was not caught yet. He was walking in the night through the, ta through the city, the streets, the alleys, not knowing which way to go. No one willing to assist him. He was now a stranger in a land that was now strange to him. Walking, battered and bruised, he saw a lady outside of her house and he sent her salam. And this elderly lady said, Wa alaykum as -salam. And then he asked her, Dear woman, could you please quench my thirst with a drink of water? And she saw this man, strange and bloodied. Usually you wouldn't have anything to do with such a person. She went, she brought him a cup of water and he drank. Then she told him, Sir, have you drank your water? He said, yes. She said, so can you please leave now? He stayed silent. She said, sir, if you drank your water, can you go to your family now, please? There must be someone waiting for you. He still didn't reply. Then she started to plead with him. Please, could you leave here? I don't feel safe with you here in front of my home. Then he told her, may I please ask a favor of you? And she said, what? And he said, I am Muslim Ibn Aqil. And I have been betrayed by people. And I need a safe haven. And she told him, you're Muslim? And he said, yes. The messenger of Hussein ibn Ali. So she told him to come in. He came inside. She had an extension to her home. She put him in that room. She brought him food. She brought him what could clean himself up, what he could clean himself up with. She laid down his mattress. He had... No hunger. He could not eat. He laid down to heal his wounds. She kept going in and out of that part of the house all night until her son felt that there was something suspicious. He asked her, Mother, why do you keep going into that part of the home? What's going on? Tell me. And she said, don't worry about it. Forget it. And he said, no, tell me. I want to know what's going on. You're acting really suspicious. So she told him, if I tell you, you must promise by God, you will not reveal the secret to anyone. And he said, I promise. And so in the dark of night, she told him, inside is the messenger of Hussein ibn Ali, Muslim ibn Aqil. I have given him safe haven here. Meanwhile, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was now settling after the battles that occurred. He was in the masjid amongst his people and soldiers and supporters. 
and he was looking to see if there were still any dissidents left. Everyone who had risen up was arrested and imprisoned. There was no one left causing any trouble. Everything had calmed down. The revolution was squashed. But he still had not found Muslim. And he needed to find Muslim. So he told his supporters, If we have to go, knock on people's doors, house by house, we will have to find this man. Now the spies of Umaidullah were already at work. They were looking everywhere. But they didn't have to work too long. Because that young boy, the young man, the son of the elderly lady, came himself, came to see Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and told him, My mother is hosting Muslim ibn Aqil in her home. If you want to take him, you can take him from our house. Ubaidullah was so pleased. He grabbed his beard and smiled and said, Okay. He sent forward 70 men and he made sure that all of them were from Quraysh or another tribe that had some sort of animosity to Ali ibn Abi Talib because of the ancestors that he had killed in Badr, in Uhud or even in Jamal and the previous wars in Safin. So anyone who had an agenda against Ali ibn Abi Talib a bone to pick, they could now pick it with the son of his brother, with his nephew, Muslim. These 70 men were taken to the house of the lady. When Muslim ibn Aqil heard the horse's hooves approaching, he knew that he had been uncovered. He stood up immediately. He put his turban on his head. He took his sword. And as the men came towards the house, he looked at the lady and told her, Thank you for keeping me safe. You can open the door. When she opened the door in fear, men ran in and Muslim began to fight immediately. Muslim was a very strong character and strong warrior. He was able to push back the people that came to fight him outside of the house. And so now he was fighting outside of the house, but he was being surrounded. He was being surrounded from in front and they went on the top of the house and they began to throw stones. So he was fighting from in front of him and he had to block the stones coming from the top. They were throwing stones and arrows with flames. Muslim kept trying to dodge the stones and fight at the same time. Now he was being wounded slowly. He was fighting them off. His lip was cut. There was blood everywhere and he was able to kill several men that were coming to fight him until they became scared to attack one by one. One of them called out, he's one man. Why are you all so scared? Come and attack him together. Muslim made sure that he had his back to a wall and his sword remained in front of him so that he could no longer be attacked from behind. And he kept fighting until the leader, known the leader of the 70, known as Ibn al-Ash'ath, he told him, stop fighting, Muslim. You're going to kill yourself. Listen, put your sword down and I promise you safety. I promise you, I will take you safely to Ubaidullah. Just stop killing our men. Put your sword down. And Muslim said, as long as I can fight, I will not give you my hand. And he kept fighting to his last breath until his energy had completely left his body. He was on his knees, but he kept trying to get up and fight. And the man told him, Muslim, if you put your sword down, I promise you safety. So Muslim looked up and finally let his guard down. When he had barely any energy left, he put his sword down and he said, I'm safe. And at that moment, those treacherous men attacked him. They took his sword, they took his turban, they took his armor, they grabbed him, they cuffed him. And then he looked at the humiliation that they were now pouring upon him. And tears strolled down his eyes. And Ibn al-Ash'ath looked at him and said, Why do you cry? One who has come to demand what you have demanded doesn't cry. He looked at him after his armor was taken, his sword was taken, his turban was taken, he was bloodied from head to toe. And he said, I don't cry for myself. I cry for my master. I cry for the one who I told to come. 
I cry for my family who is on the way who have come to help the people of this town, the people who have betrayed me, the people who have left me. I cry for the one who has no supporters. In this state, shackled and bloodied, and as these soldiers try to humiliate him, Muslim realize that this man, Ash'a, Ibn Ash'ath, talking to him, may have some softness in his heart, but he could not stop these men from doing what they were doing. So he said to him, oh man, it seems you won't be able to provide me with any safety. But I have one request for you. The man told him, what is it? Muslim told him, at least send word to my master Hussein, not to come to Kufa, that the people here have betrayed him. And so Ibn Ash'ath actually told him, if I can do it, I will do it. Then he took him to the palace. They paraded Muslim in front of the palace. And as Muslim approached the entrance, he saw people waiting for him, drinking water. And Muslim's lips were now parched. After the battle, and after having suffered so many wounds, so he looked at the water that they were drinking and they smiled and they said, you want to drink this? You will not even taste a sip of it. SubhanAllah. That he was given the same treatment that Imam al Hussein was given. Even though he could not be with his master on the day of Karbala, Allah gave him the opportunity to feel as his master would feel before his martyrdom. And then Muslim was dragged into the presence of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. And Muslim looked straight at him and said nothing. And the guard said to him, Say salam to your Amir. And so Muslim looked at him and said, He is not my Amir for me to say salam to. Ibn Ash'ath asked Ubaidullah, I have brought him, but I have promised him safety. So Abedullah looked at Ibn Ash'ath and said, Safety? Who are you? What safety do you speak about? I told you to bring him for me, not to go and keep him safe. Get out of my sight. Then he looked at him and said, I am your Amir. I am your prince. And your true leader is Yazid ibn Muawiyah, Amir al muminin You have emerged. You have risen up against the Imam of your time, against the Caliph of your time. And so Muslim looked back and said, you liar. I did no such thing. I know who the Imam of my time is. And the Khilafah is meant for us. The sons of the Prophet. al Hassan wal Hussein. And your leader Muawiyah took it. And Yazid took it. And I will never pledge allegiance to them. And so... In this moment, Ubaidullah said to him, whether you send your salam to me or not, you are going to be killed now. And Muslim said, if you kill me, then worse than you and more evil than you have come to kill who is better and more good than I am. So it's no big achievement. So Ubaidullah said, I will kill you with a death never before seen and never before felt. Ubaidullah then gave the order for Muslim to be taken to the top of the palace. As the people had gathered outside, an example was to be made of Muslim for anyone who dared rise up against the Umayyads. Muslim was taken in his bloody state to the top of the palace. He looked down at the people. And he looked into the distance and he thought of what would occur after him. Thinking only of Abu Abdullah. Thinking only of Imam al Hussein. Even in this time, imagine everyone has left him to go from having 18,000 supporters to having 10, to having to scatter, to having to fight 17 men on your own, to be promised safety, only to be betrayed. And now, 
to be taken, to be humiliated, to be taken at the top of the palace, everyone looking up at Muslim, and he looks into the distance. Of course, humiliation in front of Allah, never. Muslim was in complete honor in this state, within himself. He had done his duty to his master, but tears strolled down his face, down his cheeks, because he knew he could not be there for him afterwards. He knew that he had told him to come, and that these were the same people that were going to betray Imam al Hussein. Muslim had only tasted it before his master. He thought of Abu Abdullah in his thirsty state. Muslim was thirsty. And at this moment, he looked down at the people. The man had cut his head, the executioner cut off the head of Muslim and pushed his body from the palace and then threw his head to follow his body. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Muslim ibn Aqil was martyred and Imam al Hussein salam was going to face the perpetrators the killers of Muslim bin Aqil in the times to come. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin.